In the many years Tonto and I have spent rounding up outlaws, we've usually agreed on most things, except snacks. You see, I'm a potato chip man, and Tonto is into corn. Now we have new sun chips. Corn chips stacked in a canister. They're thin and light, like potato chips. Turns out he really likes the taste of corn. And the empties come in handy for storing my silver bullets. Sun Chips, the new brand of thin, light corn chips from Frito-Lay. I know, Sun Chips, away! Or lease from... In the morning. Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by actor Jack Demov. Jack, how are you? Fine, Mike. How are you? Good to talk to you. Jack, I'm on cloud nine right now. I'm doing fantastic. I've been a fan of The Lone Ranger all my life, and this is the first time I've had the opportunity to interview someone who's actually played the character, so it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking with you today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about that. That was a happy time of my life. I uh, very much enjoyed doing it. It was obviously a very important character to a lot of people. Many, many millions of fans around the country and uh, gotten so many nice uh, letters, uh, feedback, uh, comments, what it meant to certain people through the years. And, and, uh, you know, I came along, I think I was fourth in succession after, obviously, Clayton Moore was the the number one guy. Uh, He did it for many years. And then... uh, John Hart, and the other chap's name escapes me, but I know he was very good. But anyway, I enjoyed doing it, and it was uh, it was a departure for me. I had, you know, done a lot of things on Broadway, and I'd done Shakespearean background, and then, and I was doing uh, sitcoms, you know, opposite Mary Tyler Moore and Doris Day and Don Rickles and all of those people, uh, Sandy Duncan. And uh, so the, the Lone Ranger was a completely different about face, and it was something I had to take seriously and obviously had to really be well-schooled in because the fans are so knowledgeable. They, uh, they know all about his background and the folklore behind it. So I really had to do my homework and know all about him because these little children would come up and really hit me with questions from left and right. And I had to be on my toes and come up with the right answers. And it was it was fun. It was gratifying. It was interesting and exciting. It was always great to see the looks on their faces when they uh, are asking me questions about my horse or, or Tonto, how, and I, how Tonto and I got together. Anything about the, uh, naturally, they were all interested in the guns. They wanted to see the guns. And so it was, it was fun. It was great fun, and I enjoyed it. This year is the 85th anniversary of the creation of the Lone Ranger. He debuted on radio back in January of 1933. So this is the 85th year anniversary of the character. Now, before we talk about the Lone Ranger, I think we have to talk about what happened before it happened. So let's go back to the beginning. How did you get into acting? And was acting always your passion? Was this always the plan? Did you always see yourself becoming an actor? Well, uh, it was either that or becoming a fighter. I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. He was a leading heavyweight contender for the heavyweight championship in the late 1920s. And uh, as a boy growing up, I, I never got to see him fight. He retired before I was born. But I got to meet so many of the greats. We used to go to Dempsey's restaurant, and he knew Dempsey rather well. He was uh, Gene Tunney was one of his best friends. And, and he would take me to Stillman's gym, and then we'd, we'd go to see all of the important fights at the time with Sugar Ray Robinson and Tony Zale and and Rocky uh, Graziano and also Marciano. I have a great picture with my dad and Marciano and Mickey Walker at Dempsey's restaurant. But, you know, that's what I wanted, I thought, until uh, but I, I was exposed to both worlds. My mom was a casting director on Broadway, and so I went to see all of the plays on Broadway. And uh, I really got hooked when I saw Paul Muni in Inherit the Wind. But I knew that he knew my mother, so I took a chance. I was with a girl at the time and said, I want to go back and see if I can get to see him. And he was so gracious and uh, unbelievably kind. When I sent my mom's name back, her maiden name, and he had me come pushing right in. And we chatted, and he said, my God, what do you, you, I can't believe you're Helen's son. What is it you want to do? I said, well, I've definitely decided tonight, Mr. Muni. I said, I'm thinking about maybe becoming an actor, but now I know that's what I want to do after seeing your work. I said, you happen to be one of my three favorite actors. And he said, oh, really? Who are the other two? (laughs) (laughs) I said, at that time, I said, you know, Lars Olivier and Marlon Brando. And he slapped his forehead, and he said, my God, you put me in good company. 
again, I don't know how I came up with it, but I was proud of what I said. I said, well, Mr. Muni, I think I'm putting them in good company. <laughs> so that was a beautiful meeting. And from then day, day on, that's what I wanted to do. So I, I had a, one or two good, really good acting coaches, Her, Herbert Berghoff at the time, and another one, a wonderful lady named Mary Welch. She gave me a scholarship. But then I got connected with Lee Strasberg and the Actors Studio. And that was a totally different side of the coin. It was totally Stanislavski method. And at the time, I was on Broadway with Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan in their last play, The Visit. So that was, a, as I said, the opposite spectrum. You know, uh, they, they were so stylized in their acting, and you had to do everything the same each evening. And uh, not deviate on uh, where you stood or don't get out of the light. Or Lynn Fontan would give us notes practically every night. But when you, with Strasbourg, everything is totally different. And it's just completely relaxed and working with sense memory exercises and what have you. Evoking um, feelings from the past, you know, part of the Stanislavski method, as you probably know, is if you want to evoke a certain emotion, if it's grief or what have you, you think back in your own life, what would relate to that. And that brings up the, the proper response. And it just was interesting to me, but I uh, I wasn't total advocate of the method style. So I, I kind of picked and chose uh, whatever I thought worked for me. And uh, I think it, it worked out fairly well. I enjoyed uh, working with both of them. It was it was kind of been, you know, very, very, um, oh, I don't know. It was kind of awe-inspiring when I first walked on stage with Lynn Fontaine. She was the living legend of the theater. They had the Lynn Fontaine Theater in Broadway, you know. And she uh, looked in her 50s when she was doing that. She was actually 72 years old. And I was playing the reporter. I started as the reporter, and then I took over the role of Pedro Cabral, who was supposed to be the young lover, the Lothario, and to do it all with an accent. And I had two balcony scenes alone with her, which was really kind of daunting, but got through it beautifully. And uh, it was a great experience. And then I did uh, the Leighton Picnic opposite Inga Stevens, who was a gorgeous girl, and we loved working with each other. And uh, I think the best review I've ever gotten in my life. And uh, so I did a lot of plays, did Richard II, and I did uh, Lady in the Dark, and I did Applause, and several other. Oh, yeah, uh, the uh, name. I played Borgard in name. Anyway, a lot of theater. And I did live television, craft theater, and what have you. My first craft theater, my first live television production was with Everett Sloan and Christopher Plummer and that was that was a good good beginning on TV but then I finally decided to go out to Hollywood and I got started and I think that's when I did The Fugitive and Marcus Welby I did three Marcus Welby's love working with Robert Young and that group Jim Brolin became a friend a lot of good shows like that and leading up to uh, to getting the Lassie series where I started as Ranger Bob Erickson for three years and uh, enjoyed that experience and that was working for Jack Rather, who was the producer of Lassie and Manita Granville. And then uh, when it came time to do the uh, Lone Ranger, he wanted me. He designated me as the Lone Ranger. He thought I would fit the image that he had and uh, worked with a fellow named Nick Ramos, who was very good as Tonto. And uh, so we, uh, we had a good time doing, uh, I believe we did eight Frito-Lay commercials. I can't recall exactly. I don't have all of them. I have several of them. And they were fun. They were well done, well written by a fellow named Stan Shulman, who was a very clever writer with a good sense of humor. And they wanted to, they had quite a few personal appearances uh, riding in the parades, both in Hollywood and uh, the Santa Claus Lane Parade and, uh, uh, in New York City, you know, down Broadway in front of uh, Macy's, and uh, rearing up the horse and yelling, hi, I was for all the thousands of kids out there, and they all got a big kick out of it. They had personal appearances at the various stores like Macy's for, I don't know, thousands of kids, and that was, that was great fun. And then also the same type of thing in Hollywood. I did the parade there and the uh, Pasadena. Uh, so that was, it was great fun doing the Lone Ranger. I enjoyed playing that character. And you have to really become enveloped in it because you have to know your, your, your business when these little children come and ask you these questions that could throw you if you're not well schooled on it. So I had to do my homework, but I enjoyed all of it. It was just a good part of my life, and I have good memories of it. Were you a fan of the Lone Ranger prior to getting the role? I was for a while, yeah. I liked Clayton Moore. He was the only one I watched uh, when I was when I was a young guy. I think he thought it in black and white before they went to color. And uh, I thought, you know, they, they carried it off beautifully. I think Jay Silverhills was a great tonto. He was perfect for the role. As a fellow, had a good speaking voice, and he was, he was a good actor. But, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I liked all sorts of acting. You know, I was, I was a total... Uh, 
never tell you the art of acting. I like the people like like Paul Muni and like Marlon Brando, uh, people who are more realistic, you know. But, you know, as, as I said, being the Lone Ranger for that period of time was an outstanding part of the career because it was something totally different and kind of awe-inspiring because they, they love to see that immediate reaction with the, with the children, and not just the children, but older people. I used to get fan mail from a lot of older people, too, who would have the same sort of reaction, telling me, as you did, that you were such a big fan of Lone Ranger all your life, but so many people felt that way. And it was a good, wholesome image, uh, and I think what we really need today, even more so, uh, that type of image. Uh, I don't know how well it would work right now. I, I think it probably should, but, uh, you know, times have changed, and the business has changed so radically, and it's a totally different style, and uh, they, they try to, you know, pander to uh, the children now, the younger people. They like uh, certain films with a lot of shoot 'em ups and blood explosions and what have you. But anyway, it was a good it was a good time in history. Hopefully, they'll do something else again, another good Lone Ranger series or movie. But I think it would be uh, I think it would be well received. Now, during your career, you didn't make a lot of westerns. You only appeared in two of them. You appeared in an episode of Daniel Boone where you played a bad guy. And you appeared in an episode of Wagon Train, where you played a doctor. These were small parts, but you acted big in them. They're also memorable because the camera loves you, you have a very rich voice, you have the best hair in the business, you're a very handsome man. In a way, it's kind of sad that you had to play the Lone Ranger because they covered up your great face with that mask. But anyways, yeah, so you just did a few westerns, but then here you find yourself playing the quintessential western hero, the Lone Ranger. So I wanted to back up a little bit. When you were a kid growing up and, and you decided that you wanted to be an actor and then you started the process, you got into theater, you started doing stuff and started building up a resume so that you could pursue this career... Did you want to make westerns? Because the guys from your era, everyone grew up wanting to be a western star. I, hey, I'm going to go to Hollywood, be the next Roy Rogers, the next Gene Autry, the next Lash LaRue, the next Alan Rocky Lane, the next big star. Did you ever want to do that? Did you want to be a western star? Or were you just wanting to be an actor because you wanted to act? I just wanted to be an actor, and I wanted to take on all kinds of roles. And I, I really wasn't concerned at that time whether it had to be the leading man or whatever. I w wouldn't mind uh, playing a character, you know. But I was kind of typecast from the very beginning and always kind of the, the slick leading man. Uh, just kind of pigeonholed for a while. And uh, I was always happy when they did come along with a role that I could really get my teeth into. But it didn't happen often enough. There were certain roles that uh, I was just right for, but I, I loved doing uh, when I was able to do it on, on the road. I would go out and do things like Guys and Dolls and, uh, or uh, Streetcar or uh, The Rainmaker and various things like that. It was something that you could really, you know, get involved in. A little more serious work, but usually it was always uh, light comedy, and I was always fairly good at comedy. And I think that's the reason Doris and Mary would allow me to take the reins sometimes and come up with suggestions. But it was always in my mind I wanted to be an actor, but I wasn't particularly locked in on just wanting to do westerns I would like to do. Or I wish I had done more westerns. But being a kid from Jersey and then New York City, I moved to New York City when I was about 20. Um, and uh, I didn't have any chance to be, you know, become adept at horseback riding or anything like that. And it wasn't until I got out there and then got the Lassie series, the first show of the series. Uh, they t informed me that I had to ride bareback uh, at full speed into the surf at Malibu. <laughs> and they said, do you ride? Well, naturally, any actor, when you're right. asking a question <laughs> and you want to work, you say, right. oh, yes, of course. Right. But uh, I got together with some wranglers out in Lancaster and weren't out there every day for about two or three weeks and had them show me every trick in the book. So I wound up fairly proficient at it. They taught me how to mount the horse without putting my foot in the stirrup and how to back the horse up and how to rear it up and, and dismounts uh, as the horse is running, all that kind of stuff. I worked on it over and over and over. So that if it was ever needed, I could do it. Uh, but I became fairly proficient at it in a short amount of time. So by the time I did the Long Ranger series, it was fairly uh, easy. Uh, just, and that was a great horse they put me together with, too. But uh, the horse can always make you look good or bad. But you have to know uh, what you're doing because horse will know immediately what you, on your mountain whether or not you're, you know, you're in charge. Otherwise, they'll take over. So it was it was a totally different experience for me from doing the drawing comedy type things where you're always, you know, it's a very sophisticated character. But to go to something like The Lone Ranger was, 
was a challenge and, and fun. I enjoyed it. At the time when they cast you as the Lone Ranger, was this a big deal? Did it mean a lot to you to be the Lone Ranger, or was this just another job, just another part for you? I hate to say it wasn't a big deal. I mean, I wasn't as excited as I, I realized the importance of it after I got into it and how sure. much respect everyone had for the Lone Ranger. It was just happy that they just thought I was just what they wanted for these commercials. Actually, they were all kind of done tongue-in-cheek, and uh, and they needed the voice, and they need someone who could deliver those lines with Zoya being serious, but they're actually very funny. It was funny dialogue because of Stan Shulman and the things he wrote. But, yeah, I was, I was more and more appreciative of the fact that I was the Lone Ranger image, particularly after meeting the fans in personal appearances and seeing the looks on their faces and the adulation. And uh, then I realized how damned important it was. And uh, we had strict instructions that could never be seen out in public without the mask and the, with the outfit when you're actually playing the Lone Ranger. So going in and out of the hotels, going on to personal appearances and what have you, I had to have full regalia and uh, have the mask and uh, the, the complete outfit and be ready to act as the Lone Ranger and ask, as, answer questions as the Lone Ranger. So it was it was a kind of a daunting challenge, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. And I got into the swing of it. But initially, when they told me, I was probably thinking, oh, it's another acting job, you know. But I, I'm glad it worked out. Did your work on Lassie help you land the role of the Lone Ranger? Because obviously Lassie was also a Jack Rather production. So did your right. part on that show help I, you Lassie, get that role? It Lassie first. Uh, I was cast as um, Bob Erickson in Lassie after Robert Bray, who was the man who was playing the lead um, Forest Ranger. I believe he was on for seven or eight years. And unfortunately, he had a hunting accident, and uh, they had to replace him rather quickly. So they came up with the idea of uh, a huge uh, forest fire holocaust, where unfortunately he he lost his life in the forest fire. So they needed someone to take care of uh, Lassie, and it came to two of us. There was another fellow. Jed Allen was the other guy, and um, we both played forest rangers, so they called us Lassie Scott Fathers. And we uh, shared the series. Well, I did it for half of the series, and he did it. And then sometimes we'd work in shows together. But um, that was an experience uh, all before Lone Ranger. That was 1968, 69, I mm-hmm. think, in 70. Right. And then Lone Ranger did around 74 to 76. I can't remember the exact dates. But it was um, all because of, you know, Jack rather had the image of thinking that I was right for that particular role at that time. And I'm glad it worked out. I'm sorry that the feature film they'd been talking about doing didn't come to fruition. They wanted to uh, pair us both together because they got such great acceptance from the ratings and the public as far as our, our acceptability. And they had uh, plans to do all kinds of things, but just didn't materialize. Did you have to audition for the part of the Lone Ranger, or did they just call you up and say, hey, we want you to play the Lone Ranger? What was the process like for you getting this role? Did you have to do a screen test? Did they have you test with the actors who they were thinking about casting as Tonto? How did you get the part? They wanted to see how we did the dialogue. Actually, I was the first one chosen, and then it was up to them. And also with me, they asked my opinion, too, as to who I thought might be a good Tonto, who would I work well with. But they had me in mind for it from the beginning. They just wanted us to do some, uh, go in and do some tests, some run-throughs to see how we uh, handled a particular type of dialogue. Uh, because it still had to be a, a Lone Ranger image, totally. But we're also doing tongue-in-cheek on a lot of it, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, right. very witty dialogue. And uh, it had to be handled with the right timing and what have you. And obviously they said I had the appearance for it. Uh, I looked the part in the uh, in full costume and, and the voice was right. So it was just a question of working it out, uh, you know, as to who I would be uh, partnered with. And, and um, then it all came together. But I didn't really uh, have to audition because they, they called me and said they wanted me to play the role. So I uh, I was happy to do it. But as I said at the time, I'm thinking, oh, this is just going to be another job. But then I realized afterward the enormity of it, how important it was. And uh, I appreciated it. And as I said, I have many good memories about having done it. Made a lot of people happy. I yeah. had so many nice comments from a lot of pe- people yeah. who remember that far back. It's been so long ago, you know. Yeah. It's too bad a TV series or a made-for-TV movie or a feature film never materialized because I know the Rather Corporation would have hit a home run with you as the Lone Ranger and Nick Ramis as Tonto. 
I think you guys would have made something that we'd still be talking about to this day. I know that because it didn't even happen, and here we are 40 plus years later talking about it. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's a worthwhile subject, and I think it's a good idea that you're, you're coming up, you're following up on, especially during this time when it's an anniversary of 85 years since they began. It's important, and I'm certain a lot of people are interested in it. Jack, I'm telling you, there's so many Lone Ranger fans online who want to hear your story, and they want to know all the information on how you got the role and what your experience was like playing the Lone Ranger, because it's been a very long time since we've had any good news associated with the Lone Ranger character. I was born in the 90s, so the Lone Ranger product during my lifetime hasn't been very strong, and everyone's hated the new stuff they've made, so it feels good to be talking about something positive instead of the usual negative things. I found two of your old commercials, and this stuff is like the holy grail to a Lone Ranger fan. Also, I found pictures, and other fans have found pictures of you as the Lone Ranger, and everyone loves you, but they want to know the backstory, and they want to know why there was nothing beyond commercials and public appearances. I'm happy to do it. It's been, I'm not amazed that people still remember after all these years, right. moving here from New York City and, and L.A., where my wife lived for uh, 50 years, and uh, coming here to Macon, and everyone initially was all excited about meeting. They don't have too many actors here, uh, and uh, so to sit and listen to stories about all of the various people, but so much, as I said, has been centered around the Lone Ranger character. So when I would come in sometimes to the country club, they would be people, you know, always say, oh, hey, there so and so, could you come meet my folks at the table? And this is the Lone Ranger. This was the Lone Ranger, and the people are all excited about it. You know, which is still a, it's it's gratifying and amusing at the same time that, that there's still that kind of enthusiasm. This is from grown men and ladies. And I guess they were all young people at the time when when I did it, but always very um, great uh, great interest uh, about that character, and uh, so it makes you feel good. You know that. You did something that pleased people, and uh, they still remember it. Uh, it um, as I said, it was it was a good experience, and uh, probably one of the high points, if I think about it, of, of the career, having uh, having had that opportunity to make that kind of an impact, which was really really very sweet. Over the years, there's been so many rumors about what exactly you were hired to do as the Lone Ranger. Some people have said that you were hired just because Frito-Lay was rolling out Sun Chips and they wanted to partner with the Lone Ranger, more specifically the Rather Corporation, to help promote this product. And they needed someone to play the Masked Rider of the Plains and they picked you to play the character. Some people have said that you were hired just to do that. But other people have said that in addition to doing that stuff with Frito-Lay, you were supposed to make a movie or a TV series. The Rather Corporation had hoped and were planning on using these Sun Chips commercials as a springboard to launch a series. Hopefully everyone will love these two guys playing the Lone Ranger and Tonto, and then we can do a reboot of the Lone Ranger, because Clayton Moore had not been the Lone Ranger for several years. Jay Silverheels had been ill during that time, so they felt that it was a perfect time to recast those two roles, and they picked you and Nick to play the Lone Ranger and Tonto. So what exactly were you hired to do? This was a, that was the thought process behind it. That was, uh, you know, the intent was to revitalize the Lone Ranger image, and uh, this was a good jumping off point. Uh, and Jack, as I said, it had to go according to Jack Rather, and he w was behind it all, and he was the only one who could call the shots as to who would be the Lone Ranger. So this was some a good testing ground uh, to uh, to see the reaction of the people in the audience and with millions of people watching. And, and they had their plan. Well, they already had a script in mind they were working on, and they were working out. I forget what happened with the deal with the network. Uh, it was some, some important other producer or other was going to collaborate with Jack. And I don't remember the details now. I probably have it all written down. It's clippings of things somewhere. But uh, it just never came to fruition for one reason or another, that um, even though that uh, their, our acceptance rating was very high, and according to the public, they, they thought we were a perfect uh, Lone Ranger and Tonto. So the rest of it was all, uh, uh, however it is, you know, the politics of the film business, uh, whatever happened uh, uh, with the deal, I don't know. It was either going to be a TV movie or a feature film, and uh, it just didn't, didn't materialize.
was unfortunately that I would have liked that and uh, probably would have gone on for some time with that but it was just you know that's part of show business you never know what to expect so that was the original intent that wanted to groom uh, have someone else be uh, you know introduced as the new Lone Ranger and Tonto and that's that's what the deal was this was a good springboard and and as I said the acceptance was great and so it was when we did the parades and what have you and I did personal appearances alone and for Mattel toys and for Macy's and for you know various things as the Lone Ranger but I had to be it had to be me no one else at that time could be designated Lone Ranger uh, that was in the you know the kind of strict rules of, of Jack Rather and the organization he was the only one that could say who the Lone Ranger was in other words someone couldn't come along and say oh, I'm going to do a commercial and dress somebody up as the Lone Ranger they couldn't do it it wouldn't have been legal so I at that time was the and, and Nick were the designated people uh, I wish it had gone further it would have been nice but it didn't but we have what we have and uh, that was fun so I have no regrets about it how tall are you and how much did you weigh during the time you played the Lone Ranger uh, six two and a half I you know, joke about it I, I think I did a line on the Mary Tyler Moore show once with Ted Knight said how tall are you I think I said I'm six two and a half I'll be six three in December right that's why I asked that's why I asked <laughs> So you are 6'2", you are 6'2", and the reason, on top of the Mary Tyler Moore show, that's what I was referring to, but on top of that, the reason I asked is because I've seen tons of pictures of you as the Lone Ranger, I've seen several of the commercials you did as the Lone Ranger, and the reason I asked about height and weight is because you're a dead ringer for Clayton Moore. You look so much like him when you wear the Lone Ranger outfit. Now, you don't really look like him... If you guys are just walking around the street, you don't really no. resemble him at all. He has dark hair. You have you have brown hair. Yeah, you you actually look more like I don't even know if you're familiar with this actor, but Warren Hall. He played the Green Hornet in a serial, and he also played the Spider in two Columbia serials. You look more like him than you do Clayton Moore. But as the Lone Ranger, you're a dead ringer for him. You look a hundred percent like him. It's crazy. Now, on top of that, I'd like to ask you: Was the outfit, the costume that you wore as the Lone Ranger, was that custom made for you, or was that yeah, his definitely. wardrobe? Yeah, they spent a lot of money on the costumes. They made three of them, and they were very expensive. Wonderful woman, the seamstress who put it all together. And, and they did uh, spend a lot of money in the saddle alone. The saddle, I think, was worth about twenty thousand dollars or something. It was everything was silver, real silver. And the, the guns were very expensive. And it, they spared no expense. The uh, the clothes had to be fit perfectly. It was custom fitted on me, you know, just to, to my measurements. So I was uh, I was about one hundred and ninety eight pounds all my life, and that's six almost six foot three. So they just designed it completely to, to suit me to create that image of the Lone Ranger. And I, I can see what you're saying. I guess there was similarity between Clayton Moore and myself. He was it wasn't quite as big, but he was he was a you know stalwart looking guy, and he was a great image. In the mask, you guys are twins. Outside of the mask, you guys don't look anything alike. But one thing that really makes the similarities in your appearance come to life is the fact that you guys wear the same costume. The costume Clayton Moore wore during the color years of the Lone Ranger TV series is the exact same costume you wore during your time as the Lone Ranger. The hat, the shirt, the pants, the bandana, the boots, that great gun belt. That gun belt you guys used is the best gun belt ever. Best gun belt in the history of Hollywood is that Lone Ranger gun belt that you and Clayton Moore wore when you guys played the Lone Ranger. The costumes are identical. Now, the mask is the same style, but Clayton's eye holes were a little bit larger than yours. The eye holes on your mask look kind of tight, so how well could you see when you wore the mask? Some of the actors who played the Lone Ranger have said that they have trouble seeing when they wore the mask, especially when they had to look down. Did you encounter any of these problems? Did you have any problems seeing when you wore the mask? I'd had real no, no difficulty with it, strangely enough. I thought I might uh, going into it, but they, they really custom made it for me so that the area uh, around the eyes was large enough that I could have some, uh, you know, unimpaired vision. It was, uh, I could see, uh, you know, uh, a good spectrum uh, from left, right to left and up and down, what have you. So I never did run into any difficulty with that. And it wasn't 
too uncomfortable after you got used to it. It almost became second nature wearing it. It, it was kind of fun, but, you know, just uh, once in a while when you're walking around in public with that outfit, it gives you that feeling of, uh, I don't know, it's it's just kind of a, a private feeling. Uh, you know, it's just you as the Lone Ranger. They don't really know what I look like. I'm thinking to myself when these people are all coming around wanting to shake hands or get autographs, but uh, it's just the image of the Lone Ranger. That's all they're seeing. They're not seeing Jack the Mob. They're seeing a Lone Ranger. So that's why it's supposed to be. And I think that's what we achieved. What size shoe do you wear? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. 12. Oh, so you, you actually have a bigger foot than they said you had in Adam 12. Because there's an episode of Adam 12 you did where they're looking for a guy who committed a crime. And they think it's you, but actually you 11, right. Yeah, size 11. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I have that I have, that, uh, I have that, uh, that show, I believe. Yeah, I remember I was looking through some of the old things last week. And I did see that, but seen with uh, Kent McCord and, uh, and my uh, old buddy Marty Milner. Yeah, that, that's what they said at the time. I guess that was just the script, but I really wear, always wore an 11 and a half, but then it became a 12. I don't know how your foot gets bigger, but it did. Do you have any pieces of the costume? Please tell me you still have the mask and the gun belt, that great mask. I love that it's not the full mask. I love when the Lone Ranger's mask still has the bottom of the nose not covered. I love that. And I also love that gun belt. It's a fancy gun belt. It's beautiful. It's the best gun belt ever. Please tell me you have these things. Did they let you keep anything? No, I wish I did. It was great outfits. No, I couldn't. They were very strict about that. When we did, stopped doing it, we turned everything in. You know, they, as I said, no one would have been able to go around looking like the Lone Ranger anyway. It wouldn't have been accepted. So. But it would have been nice just to have it as memorabilia, you know. But if I ever wanted to do a, another uh, personal appearance anywhere, then it would have to go through with a rather corporation or whoever now has the rights to all of that. But at the time, I was it, and myself, and and, and uh, if had they ever wanted to portray Lone Ranger at that time, it had to be me, you know. So I was in hopes that it was going to lead to a feature film, and uh, or, the, or even a TV movie. They had something they had talked to me about. I forgot the title of it. I I don't know. I don't recall. It was so long ago. But it would have been nice, and uh, would have added to the longevity of it. And uh, you know, it's nice uh, as to, as an actor to have a, a role that uh, that people appreciate, and you can keep on doing it, even though uh, you know I I prefer acting. My I guess most actors would say that preferable form of acting would be on stage, live stage, because you get the immediate response from the audience, and, the, and uh, whether it's a comedy or a drama, and you can work with it. You can come back each evening, each performance, and tweak it a bit. You're going to embellish or something or delete something or, and just uh, keep working on it. But when you do something on film, you can't. That's it. It's done. It's in the can. And it's uh, not quite as gratifying as working in person. And so when I did the personal appearances, I really loved that with the public. That really worked great and, and have a spontaneous reaction with people. But the, I had to say that doing those commercials, they were so cleverly done and well written that uh, they were easy to do to, for me anyway. And I did, as I said, I had a certain flair for timing and as far as comedy. So I, I think that stood me in good stead. When you were making these Lone Ranger commercials for Frito-Lay, how much riding did you do? How much fighting did you do? And also, the Lone Ranger obviously doesn't shoot to kill, but he does use a gun, so how much shooting did you do? Uh, riding, yes. With the riding in and out of town and uh, uh, cutting the corn. I remember a very, very sharp turn. I was riding full speed into the western town. And the horse, if I've got a shot of it. It's a great shot. It looks like the horse is on one hoof, returning the corner. Um, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of action like that, but we didn't have any shooting in any of the uh, commercials. How about in your public appearances? Because when Clayton Moore did his public appearances, he was always doing some gun twirling and stuff like that. Did you ever do anything like that? I could do that, yeah. I, I was pretty good with the gun. I had a fast draw. I used to, well, when I was a kid, I, I uh, kind of emulated some of the you know the top stars at the time. And I would find myself, I guess I was around 12, 13 years old, standing in front of the TV, outdrawing these people in the West. <laughs> I had a set of guns, and I, I practiced that a lot. And then practice the twirling and what have you. Uh, you know, it looks good. It's uh, Anybody who really handles a gun doesn't fool too much with that, but it's uh, it's flashy and the kids like to see it. You know? Just like Clayton Moore, 
You worked with two of the most iconic animals of all time. You worked with Lassie on Lassie, and you worked with Silver when you played the Lone Ranger. How was it riding Silver? How was it working with that oh, horse? Great. He made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful horse. And uh, coupled with the fact, as I said, I had crammed and gotten all of those lessons from these guys who were great, these three wranglers. They put me through the hoops and had me doing everything, jumping over things and what have you, and really looking proficient. Uh, But naturally, afterwards, I kept on doing it on my own, just to make certain that I really was becoming a good rider. But initially, I had to really cram and get it done within a few weeks before I had the first uh, experience riding. But working with a uh, horse like Silver, they make you look good. They're really well-trained and a uh, beautiful animal. So that was that was no difficulty at all. Did you work with just one horse? Was it the same horse the entire time you played the Lone Ranger? Or were there multiple horses used to play Silver during your two-year run as the Masked Man? Uh, I only recall using uh, having the one horse. Um, yeah, had it gone on longer, you know, yeah. naturally that probably, but had we done a feature or what have you, it could have been uh, involving maybe another horse. But as it was with the Lassie series, there were always two or three uh, standing by. There was one for the acting scenes and one for the fight scenes and another one standing by in case anything happened. But, you know, my uh, recollection is I only had the one horse. You got rave reviews after your appearance as the Lone Ranger in the 1976 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You looked great riding silver during the parade, and everyone loved you, and all the fans thought you did a great job as the Lone Ranger, and no one complained. No one was sad. No one was disappointed that you weren't Clayton Moore. Back then... Right around that time was the time when fans started to get into the mindset of, well, if it's not Clayton Moore, then it's not the Lone Ranger. Only Clayton Moore is the Lone Ranger, but some way, somehow, you were able to avoid that, and you got great reviews for playing the Lone Ranger in that parade and making an appearance on that day. So I'm just curious, what was that experience like? Well, it was very gratifying because obviously it evoked the kind of feeling that they had for the Lone Ranger. They they looked upon me then as not just some guy who's dressed up in an outfit riding a white horse, but they looked upon me as the Lone Ranger, resurrected. Uh, and they couldn't believe it. You know, I'm riding up Broadway and yelling high ho silver and rearing the horse up, and waving at the kids. And it uh, it was a good experience, and the multitudes were, you know, the the... the the roar of the crowd was kind of deafening him. And, 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 I, and then you realize on top of that afterwards that it was also seen by millions of television viewers at the same time. So it was it was very rewarding. And I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that part of it. You just really had to do your job and be the Lone Ranger. You know, you had to fulfill the image. And I think we did that pretty well. During your two-year run as the Lone Ranger, how many public appearances did you make? Nine or ten or whatever. I can't recall. I remember the one time in particular when they had me standing in the toy department at Macy's and the children were lined up outside in the street waiting to get in. And and, uh, that took hours. That must have been about a four-hour ordeal. I had to stop and talk to each one of the children and let them have a see a bullet or give them a silver bullet or tell them all the answers that, you know, about how what happened with the Lone Ranger and Butch Cavendish and, and how uh, Tonto found me and nursed me back to health because I was the only Ranger that survived out of all of the troop. Ergo, the, the title, the Lone Ranger. And uh, Tonto became his uh, long life uh, companion, Kemasabi. And uh, it was, you know, the folklore was interesting. And I, I as I said, I studied all about it because they were very serious about uh, making certain I do, knew the answers because that would blow the whole image if uh, children would ask me something and I'd come up with the wrong answer. But it was it was kind of a heavy experience, but uh, I got through it well and, and I think made a, quite a few fans along the way. So I enjoyed it very much. It's a great image and I think it could still go on and they could still do something wonderful with it. And I would like to see that. Just curious, when you were out doing public appearances, did anyone ever mistake you for Clayton Moore? Did anyone ever think you were Clayton Moore and tell you stuff or ask you questions about the TV series that he did? Yeah, from time to time, periodically. A lot of people, naturally the older people who were knowledgeable enough, realized that the discrepancy in age that, you know, Clayton Moore was around a good deal earlier than my, than my, 
when I began. Uh, uh, so, you know, they would be a cognizant of the fact there was a younger guy. But uh, some of the kids, that all it all just blows together. All I know is you're the Lone Ranger and you're the one that's been there all along, you know. So they, they didn't uh, differentiate as, as to whether or not I was Clayton Moore or whatever. They just, uh, 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 it just I was just the Lone Ranger. I was the image. That seems to be all that was important. The Frito-Lay commercials, where did you film those? Out in the valley, uh, some ranch out there, uh, and uh, we they had the western town all put together. Um, I forget the name of it. It's a well-known ranch they use quite often in films uh, to do westerns out in uh, Lancaster or Newhall or in that area in California. And uh, there's one commercial I don't have. I think I have five or six of them. Oh, there's one that I particularly like. A girl named Kathy Crosby was in it playing one of the dance hall girls. There were several dance hall girls in it. Right. I meant to try to contact Stan. If you have any conversation with him further, you might ask him if he has a copy of that. I wouldn't mind getting a copy of that. The only ones that he has are the one where outlaws are breaking in to the jail. You say outlaws are breaking into jail? Yes, sir. Last night I locked up two. This morning there were ten. Mm. Maybe it's the Sun Chips brand, corn chips. No wonder. Sun Chips are just too tempting, deputy. So thin and light, like potato chips. But with the great taste of real corn. Psst. Don't know what you're in for, masked man, but you sure gonna love this jail. <laughs> Sun Chips brand, thin like corn chips from Frito-Lay. To get Sun Chips. Right. And then he also has one where you and Tonto are riding in a stagecoach. And you guys are protecting a supply of sun chips. Mm, it is enough in Timasabi we get to ride in the comfort of the stagecoach. Stay low, Tonto. The Butch Cavendish gang must not be allowed to intercept the shipment of new sun chips brand thin light corn chips. Today, mm, they're in for a big surprise. Okay, driver. Just you toss down those canisters of sun chips and you won't get hurt. Oh boy, Butch. Delicious. Thin and light as potato chips. But with a great taste of corn. Now, Tonto. (laughs) Sorry, Cavendish. Men like you must not be allowed to deprive people of the taste of sun chips. Driver, see that these outlaws are brought to justice. That I will, masked man. But is their justice strong enough for them that would steal sun chips? Sun chips brand thin light corn chips, new from Frito Lay. I owe sun chips away. And then he oh, yeah, also David Huddleston was in yeah. that too. And then he also has one where you're just talking to the camera and you're talking about how the empty can for the sun chips can also be used to hold your silver bullets. Yeah. Yeah. They come in handy for yeah. storing my silver bullets. I dropped the bullet into the can, which yeah. made that titty sound, which is very funny. I thought that was a great commercial. Can you do that again? Can you do that again? In many years, Tonto and I have spent rounding up outlaws. Uh, we've always agreed on most things. You see, I'm a potato chip man, and Tonto is into corn. And then Tonto has his dialogue, and then I say, and the canisters come in handy for storing my silver bullets. Plunk. <laughs> I got chills hearing you do that. Your voice is so rich, and and that was just uh, thank you. You just did an amazing job. And yes, the commercials they're they're kind of campy, but yeah, yes, the commercials they're kind of campy, but your appearance as the Lone Ranger and your voice and the way you guys work together, you guys made a great combination of the Lone Ranger and Tonto. The way you guys did those commercials was great. You guys were laughing with the character and not at it. The Lone Ranger movie from 2013 with Johnny Depp and Army Hammer was horrible. And it was horrible for tons of different reasons. But one of the main reasons why it was so bad is because it made fun of the character. You can tell Stan Shulman, the man who wrote your commercials, knows and loves the character. Where the guys who made the 2013 movie don't know and don't care about him. It's just disappointing that you and Nick never got to make a movie or a TV series because I would have loved to have seen you guys have a chance to do a long, serious performance because I think you guys were great together. Now, had you gotten a chance to play the Lone Ranger in a feature film or made-for-TV movie or in a TV series, what would have your take 
on the character Ben? Would you have tried to do it like Clayton Moore did it? Would you have tried to do something that hadn't been done before? What would have been your approach? My own style, but I would have been true to the tradition of the Lone Ranger and what I felt that the character should bring to the screen. Uh, I think that uh, he's such an important image, and he has to be someone that the young kids can adulate. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, someone that has to be respected, and so I, I would do it with a certain authority, but also in a, in a natural, hopefully, form of acting, not not trying to do the tongue-in-cheek comedy kind of thing we did with Frito-Lay, but really, really believe the character and, and say the lines accordingly as the Lone Ranger. Uh, but I think I would do it my own style. I wouldn't copy Clayton Moore. I've, I've never copied anyone, so I, I wouldn't have done that. But that, I think that would have been a great opportunity and a great experience. I would have loved to have been able to develop that character further because there was so many limitless uh, possibilities. And I think it could really been something special. And I'm sorry, too. I, I regret it that it didn't go further. But unfortunately, it was out of my control. But it would have been a very, very nice uh, legacy, I think, uh, for many people and for myself, too. Whether it was coming from the Rather Corporation or Frito-Lay, what was the direction you got from the people in charge? How did they want you to play the Lone Ranger? Well, they, they liked what I did because the, the dialogue spoke for itself. So sure. I tried to be the Lone Ranger as, you know, as serious as I could. But also, the, you know, the dialogue, as I said, was comical. It was funny. Uh, but it had to be done certain tongue-in-cheek style. But I liked playing the Lone Ranger as serious as I could. But I know I'm realizing as I'm saying the dialogue that this is not really serious stuff, you know. He, he's doing it as though he thinks he's serious. But I'm realizing that the reaction from the audience audience is going to be laughs because it was funny dialogue. How did they want you to play it when you were performing in these commercials? Did they want you to be a salesman first and the Lone Ranger second? Or did they just want you to be the Lone Ranger who just so happened to be promoting a product? Well, no, just be the Lone Ranger doing the dialogue. I think the dialogue itself would sell the product. Sure. Uh, I think that was, you know, uh, just automatic because the dialogue was, well, it was all in the vein of humor, obviously. You know, the other people might have been doing their lines straight, but uh, the uh, the Lone Ranger's dialogue was very funny and very wry and witty. But uh, I didn't want to do it as though, here, I'm telling a joke, and uh, because that's the worst thing you can do as a comedy is to say, I'm being funny, so I'm going to act funny. You just... You act the character. You, as the character of the Lone Ranger, you just say the dialogue as he would say it, and that the dialogue spoke for itself. It was just funny, funny material. But I didn't go into it thinking, "Here, I've got to try to be in a, you know, a salesman and sell this product." I'm, I'm just doing the, the lines uh, as they uh, they wrote them, and as the Lone Ranger, and totally in character. The thing is to stay in character all the time. If you get out of character, you you've got you've got a problem. You know, uh, try to tell that to a young actress. Uh, well, young actress, I just shouldn't mention her name. Maureen Reagan. I played opposite her, and she tried to become an actress. And she had the idea that if she's doing a comedy line, she had to go stand up to the footlights and tell it out to the audience, and they're smiling, waiting for a laugh. <laughs> So that was an unusual experience, but that's that's what comes with people not having enough background or experience. But uh, no, with this, it was just be the Lone Ranger, be the character, and the dialogue spoke for itself. And I wasn't trying to push it as a salesman, you know, as you might do with another commercial where you're just talking about the product. It's just this is what I I like. I know I like the as the Lone Ranger talking about. I like this product, you know, but it's not. To him, it's just this is this is uh, as I said, this would come in handy for storing my silver bullets. The dialogue is so funny, you can't help but laugh at it. But the beauty of it is to do it with with a serious face and serious attention. I mean, I think that's that's the way I viewed it anyway. Apparently, that's what they wanted because they all seem to like them. They spent a lot of money on each one of those commercials. What was it like working with Nick Ramis, the actor who played Tonto? Uh, he was okay. He, he was a, a good guy. He had his own lifestyle, and uh, you know, he, he used to uh, certain ideas what he thought that they should do that maybe he wasn't being utilized enough or what have you. And uh, taking it all very seriously, and I, I, I talked to him and I said, Nick, it's you know, let's just do it and do it as a characters and just enjoy it. Just have fun with it. Don't worry about why you why this or why that or why aren't they doing this. So, you know, just do what what's asked for in the script, but do it the best you can, your, your way, you know, bring your own style to it. So, But we uh, we had a couple of conversations like that, but he was 
fine. He was he was good as the character, and uh, he made a good Tonto. They asked me, uh, they had several Tontos in mind when we uh, were doing it uh, on tape to show what it was going to look like, and then one of the fellows would, would have been very good. They had, uh, oh God, what was his name? He was a very good actor. He played Indians a lot. Uh, Ned Romero, I think, was his name, and he, he was one of the contestants for it, but uh, Nick got the role. They felt that he might have looked more of the part, I think, a bit more like Jay Silverheels. So that's how he was chosen. But we didn't become buddies or anything, but he was a nice guy. We, we had a good time working together. So I think he passed away, as I recall, not hearing not too long ago. Do you know about that? I'm not certain. He passed away back in 2007, but I'm not sure what caused his death. He was 77. Oh, yeah, I thought I had heard that. Yeah, I wasn't certain. Because we lost contact. I hadn't been in touch with him since we did the actual you know, commercials. And then they didn't have... They had him on one of the parades, you know. And, you know, I guess they had him in two of the parades. And one night just had me. And then they had me alone in the personal appearances in Macy's and what have you. But it was, it was a good association. You knew the main man in charge, Jack Rather. He was the gentleman who owned the rights of the Lone Ranger character at the time. So I'm dying to know because there's not very many people that I can talk to who knew this man. So what was he like? Very likable man. Very, very kind. uh, Very uh, enthusiastic. Uh, Always, always had a good, uh, uh, very positive comment to make about anything I did or anything uh, with the production. If there was anything troubling him, he would uh, probably tell the the director, but uh, always very quietly, very much a quiet gentleman, laid back. She was actually more of a motivating character. She was, she would get involved, especially with the the weekly shooting of the various things. Uh, She would have an idea as to what she wanted, very set ideas, and I think he listened to her a lot too, but he was a very likable man. I liked him a lot. Very, very nice gentleman. They had my wife and I go to when we first when I first met him, I got the Lassie series, and we all had to go to his home in Beverly Hills. And I had pictures with Lassie and Rudd Weatherwax and, and, and Jack Rather and so forth. I don't. I wish I had some of those. I, I think I have one with my wife and, and Lassie, but I, uh, I don't know if I still have any with Jack or Benita. But very, very nice man. I liked him a lot. And uh, he had a lot of authority. He was a bright man and uh, very successful, and obviously. The Rather Corporation in Beverly Hills was a nice you know, building a nice landmark there. Uh, I used to go up to that office quite often for various things. They had a comic book out that I had to go up and pose, pose for some pictures and uh, had to sign some contracts for that, some certain periodicals. I don't have any of those. I wish I could get some. I used to have them. I don't know what's become of them in the various moves I've made. I lost a lot of that memorabilia. But uh, he was always very affable and easy to talk to. But, uh, a, you know, very bright man, obviously, and very successful. His wife, actress Benita Granville, she not only was his wife and a very important lady behind the scenes, but she also was the leading lady in the 1956 feature film, The Lone Ranger, starring Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels. So she's someone who's very well known to Lone Ranger fans. What was she like? Well, she was quite a strong lady. Uh, very, very definite opinions. Obviously, he knew a good deal about acting, having been an actress uh, all her life since she was a very young girl. Played a lot of good roles in some very, very fine movies. But uh, very knowledgeable about what she wanted and uh, uh, on hands. You know, she wasn't shy about telling the directors uh, what uh, what she wanted, what she thought should be done. But uh, as I said, a little more vocal than Jack would have been. Jack really wasn't around on set that much. Uh, but she was she was there and uh, a very bright lady, very very sweet lady. But uh, she knew what she wanted and she. Uh, she wasn't someone you know anyone would take lightly. She 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 had a certain presence and an authority. And people paid attention to her. They called her Bunny Bunny Grandel. Right. Right. A very nice lady. I, I remember her fondly. Both she and Jack were very nice people. I liked them both. Do you remember a gentleman by the name of Stanley Stunnel? Sure. Stan was a wonderful guy too. He and his wife and my wife and I used to get together for dinner. They had a nice place in Beverly Hills and we'd go eat at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel or and they used to like to ride around at Christmas time, uh, up and down Wilshire, look at the lights and they got a big kick out of it. And they had a boat and they invited my wife and I to the boat and we had some 
nice times there. Very nice man. I like Stan and his wife. His name was Billy. I don't know if they're still around. You've lost touch with them, too. So many people, you always think at the time you're going to stay friends for a long time and always be in touch, but that's the nature of show business. You, you come close with people while you're working with them, and then all of a sudden you don't see them anymore. The reason I ask about him is because he's really an important player in the Lone Ranger history because he was the guy really running stuff. Yes, Jack Rather owned the character, but Stanley Stunnel, he was the guy, especially in the later years after you had already left the role of the Lone Ranger, Stanley Stunnel was really the guy running everything. He was the guy who brought on the lawsuit against Clayton Moore. A lot of people blame Jack Rather for the whole Clayton Moore situation, but it's really Stanley Stunnel who was running stuff. Yeah, he was more of the businessman. Yeah. He was he was uh, almost like an accountant, but he was on top of everything. He was uh, right. he was a very good businessman, and, and you know could be very affable and fun loving. But when it came down to business, he was all business, mm-hmm. and right. uh, he was looking out for the product and uh, for the best uh, possible you know outcome for uh, anything being connected with the with the product, both the Lassie Show and the Lone Ranger. Yeah, because I remember him from both. But uh, he used to come visit the set, and he'd have quite a quite an input as well. Uh, actually, you're right. He was more so than Jack. Jack was the titular head. He was behind the scenes. But Stan was a very prominent character in uh, the negotiations and, and uh, proper use of the, the you know the, the trademark of the Lone Ranger. What could be done? What couldn't be done? What they would allow? You know, uh, it it would all boil down to Stan. I liked him. He was a nice guy. The reason I ask is because he was such such an important guy to the character, and I didn't even know that name. I had never heard that name until I read David Rothel's book, and David Rothel's the man who told me about you, because he was a guy who gave a great review on you playing the Lone Ranger, and I had never heard of Stanley Stunnel before. I had always assumed that Jack Rather was the guy in charge, because he's the guy who gets blamed for all that, but then I heard about Stanley Stunnel, so I have to know about this guy, so what was he like? Was was he a younger guy? Was he around your age at the time? Was he older than you at the time? He, Tell me about him. A little older than me. He was younger than Jack. Sure. And younger than Bonnie. But uh, he was, uh, I would say he was probably in his early 50s, I, to my knowledge, around that time. Uh, I would think in early to mid 50s. Uh, he was older than I was, but, uh, you know, businessman type. To look at him, you would think he would be a banker or something, you know. Uh, but uh, very, very knowledgeable and uh, intelligent fellow. But very, very affable when they when had good hosts and hostess, as I said, we enjoyed their company. But he was all business when it came to that, and he uh, had certain, you know, parameters that they wouldn't go beyond. He would, he knew what had to be done as far as preserving the image and the, the trademark of the of the Lone Ranger name. So he was he was the turn to guy. So it, it it was upsetting that whole thing about Je- uh, you know, with uh, Clayton. But Clayton obviously wanted to stay with the with the character, and he thought that the public wanted that. But they felt that he had been you know he outgrown it, and it was a bit he was not quite in the same shape as he had been, and uh, you know gained a bit of weight or whatever. And they just didn't want him to continue continuing. But he insisted on still wearing the mask, and I know they had to go into a court situation about that. Finally, it became resolved, but. That was uh, it was an ongoing saga for a while. Got a lot of attention, public, and, you know, publicity wise. But uh, I know Stan was very prominent, prominent in all of that. Frito Lay not releasing Sun Chips ended your run as the Lone Ranger. Had Frito Lay released Sun Chips, you would have continued to make those commercials, and you would have continued on as the Lone Ranger, and possibly that would have led into a reboot of the TV series or a made-for-TV movie or a feature film. But Sun Chips not being released by Frito-Lay is what ended your time as the Lone Ranger. Now, people get confused when they hear that Frito-Lay didn't release Sun Chips because right now you can go to your store and buy Sun Chips. So people get confused when they hear that. Frito-Lay didn't release Sun Chips, but why am I eating Sun Chips? Like, people don't understand what exactly went on during that time. The story is Pringles, which is what these Sun Chips were supposed to be competing with, because if you look at the actual chip, they look like a Pringle, and the canister, the, the little can that they come in, is identical to what Pringles come in. So, 
Sun Chips that Frito-Lay was making, the ones that you were promoting as the Lone Ranger, those were supposed to be the competitor of Pringles. And Frito-Lay got scared off when they saw that Pringles' sales went down right before they were ready to release this chip. And because the sales went down, Frito-Lay got scared off and that ended your time as the Lone Ranger. Some people get confused when they hear about that because they go, well, I'm eating Sun Chips right now. How could they not be released? But that's because they looked like Pringles and were packaged like Pringles, not like the Sun Chips that we have now that are wavy and square. These look like Pringles. So that's where the confusion is, and I just wanted to clear that up. But while we're on the topic of these chips, you're one of the only people in the world who ever ate any of them. So how did they taste? They were terrific. I loved them. I used to uh, get cans of them, and uh, we'd serve them at parties and what have you. I liked them a lot, and I don't know why they ever changed it, because uh, it was uh, it was a delicious product, and I thought it was well done. I enjoyed it. It was a good product. I wasn't, I wasn't lying when I'd be talking to people about how, how good it was, because I really uh, I did like it myself. Do you have any memories of being on set? Do you have any good stories you can share with us? Oh, just uh, usually you try to stay in character as much as I could. When something would go wrong, I always say something about, where the hell is Santa when I need him? Like that, you know. <laughs> Never around. Where's the Indian? Never around when I need him. You know, they used to put, you know, I played a lot of celebrity golf tournaments, too. Sure. <laughs> During that period, if I'd be up on the tee and I'd, everybody would be announcing, and here's uh, Jack the mob, and he's the Lone Ranger, so what? and then if I'd hit a bad shot, I'd say, no. Oh, for God's sake, I said, again, I'd use that line, I always got to laugh, where the hell is Tonto when I need him? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, That's great. It was just, I don't know, there was just so many things going, you know, jokes and interacting with the crew and with our various people uh, and staying in character and coming up with some, I don't remember what, but we used to come up with some lines that cracked everybody up, I remember. And uh, usually it was, you know, back and forth. Uh, regarding, uh, you know, the characters of Lone Ranger and Tonto, putting ourselves in their position. But I can't remember any any particular one I, I, mm-hmm. that I could share with you. Okay. It's just a kind of a, a light uh, atmosphere, and everybody was having a good time. The two filming locations most closely associated with the Lone Ranger character are Iverson Movie Ranch in Chatsworth, California, and Lone Pine in Lone Pine, California. Iverson Movie Ranch because the Lone Ranger TV series with Clayton Moore as the Lone Ranger and Jay Silverheels as Tonto, they did a lot of their on-location shooting at Iverson Movie Ranch. And in the beginning of the show, the opening of the show, when the Lone Ranger rides up, up the hill and to that rock, that rock is called the Lone Ranger's Rock, and that rock is located at Iverson Movie Ranch. So that's why that's special. That's why that's a special location to the Lone Ranger character. And Lone Pine is special to the Lone Ranger character because during the third season, when John Hart took over the role as the Lone Ranger, they did their on-location shooting at Lone Pine with him. And then in the fifth season, after Clayton Moore came back, He came back in the fourth season, but in the fifth season, that's when they returned to Lone Pine and some of their outside shots were done at Lone Pine. When they went on location, they went back to Lone Pine. And Lone Pine is also special because in the 1938 serial, the first time the ambush and how the Lone Ranger became the Lone Ranger, the ambush scene was filmed at Lone Pine in the Alabama Hills. And that was actually the first time that that storyline had been created that was not a part of the Lone Ranger origin prior to that movie serial so there's a lot of history within those two locations both because of movie serials and the TV series so Lone Pine and Iversons are very special to the Lone Ranger character now whether it was with you as the Lone Ranger or just in another production that you were doing whether it was a movie or a TV show did you ever do any filming at either Lone Pine or Iverson's? The ranch, the ranch we did, yeah. And they, I wish I could remember the name of the oh, that was uh, out there. It was either uh, Newhall or Saugus or Lancaster, all in that area. Okay. They had this 
town already set up with the, with the saloon and what have you, and the sheriff's office, and uh, they were good locations with the dusty streets and, uh, you know, the, the great atmosphere. Uh, but I, I think one was a Cubison Ranch or some, some, or some sounding ranch like that. Uh, it was well used for a lot of films, a lot of Western. Uh, they would go out to that area, not just, not just us. Now the big question, because everyone is dying to know the answer to this question because it's been so many years we've heard all the rumors about why this series didn't happen, why you never made a movie, why you didn't do more beyond public appearances and the commercials that you did. So why didn't it happen? Well, again, I think it was all the, you know, the devious machinations, everything that was going on behind the scenes about whether or not to keep that product the way it was or change it. That, that threw a monkey wrench into things. And then, then the, uh, the popularity of the characters, regardless, they, they loved uh, us as the Lone Ranger Tonto. So that's what was the intention from there to go on further with it because we were accepted so uh, widely by the public to do a, a feature film. And, uh, and then they talked about a, a TV movie and, uh, they gave me the title for one of them but they just never came to fruition because whatever was going on behind the 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 scene i I wasn't privy to all of the you know the dealings as to what was happening with the script and i think it was in conjunction with another top producer and i can't remember who that was i know it's written down in some if i look through books or paperwork i've got it somewhere but they uh, they were going to go into uh uh, in an alliance uh, to do the film together, but uh, that didn't happen. Well, I don't know. They might have not come to agreement on on uh, you know what the uh, outcome of the deal would be. But I I just don't recall all the the details of that. I was outside of that, just waiting for the call to say yay or no. We're going to go with the film. We're going to do this. And I would have been ready to go and start and uh, be the Lone Ranger for as long as they liked, but. It, did, it just didn't happen, unfortunately, because I was getting used to it and I was having a good time with it. But that was all in, out of my hands, unfortunately. Uh, I, so I can't really tell you much more about that. Was there a script? And if so, did you read it and do you remember anything from it? I saw a synopsis of uh, one, yeah. Uh, but, uh, it was searching for something, and I, I think it was searching for gold somewhere. Uh and I don't have that. I don't have that uh, to to even refer to. Oh that was, man! So at the time, I it was kind of didn't pay that much attention to it. I figured it was going to happen sure. fine. I just probably tossed the, right. the pages aside. But uh, it would have been it would have been something in, to that effect. And uh, but I I can't go into detail about that because mm-hmm. I don't really recall it. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry I couldn't help you more on that. But that's okay. They, um, yeah, I would have yeah. enjoyed doing it. As I said, it would would have been a nice nice uh, addition to my career. And uh, you know, apart from the other things that I did, the serious things and the comedies and all of that, that would have been another nice nice section or part of my career. So, but you go with what you've got, you know, and that it just have to uh, just have to be satisfied that I did have uh, some some uh, you know relationship with the Lone Ranger character, and I enjoyed it very much. And again, if you don't know, it's okay to say that you don't know, but this TV movie or movie or TV series, whatever you want to call it, this was just a Lone Ranger adventure. This wasn't an origin story on how you became the Lone Ranger. No, no, it wasn't. No, uh, it, it could have been. It should have been, actually. That would have been a good idea. Hadn't they ever done that prior to that, about how what happened with the Butch Cavendish gang? I thought they might have. I don't know. I didn't see all of the Lone Ranger things prior to that. But I thought that was kind of the folklore. When they used to talk about it in the comic strip or the magazine articles I saw, they would talk about that, uh, about how, you know, Tonto was the one that found it, but he was the lone survivor. Consequently, became known as the Lone Ranger, and he was the one that nursed him back to health. And, uh, you know, he just, uh, we we're talking about funny stories. Obviously, you've heard it. Everyone has told that joke over and over. But it was one of the jokes on the set at the time, you know, when supposedly uh, Tonto and Lone Ranger were surrounded by hundreds of Indians, bloodthirsty Indians. <laughs> you know, and they all, I think you know the joke I'm right. talking about. And they, yeah, he's, <laughs> he said, uh, well, Tonto, I think, uh, you know, we're going to have a problem here with all of these Indians. And Tonto says, what do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great joke. Yep, I, I've heard that many times, but I wanted to hear it from you. I wanted to hear it from the Lone Ranger, and I wanted to hear your voice tell it. <laughs> well, that always get, killed me. I like that. Yeah. Everybody always got a kick out of it. Now it's so well known, you know. I, I may have 
just change the dialogue a bit, but that was the essence sure. of it. It right. was a funny, funny right. line. In 1981, they put out a movie called The Legend of the Lone Ranger, and even though it was shortly after your run as the Lone Ranger, they decided to cast a different actor. Clinton Spilsbury played the Lone Ranger in the 1981 film The Legend of the Lone Ranger. Did you ever see that movie? I did not. No, no, I, I never did see the film, so I don't know too much about it. I can't offer an opinion on it. Okay. The reason I ask is because, okay, so here you are, you're playing the Lone Ranger, there's talks of a possible movie, but then they shut it down because Frito-Lay goes in a different direction, and for whatever reason, the movie and all the stuff that they thought was going to happen when they cast you as the Lone Ranger, that doesn't happen. Then a few short years later... They come back, and here we are seeing at the Man's Chinese Theater, they're rolling out Clinton Spilsbury and Michael Horse as the Lone Ranger in Tonto. And he's, I don't think it's the same horse, but the uh, tack that you used on your horse, Silver, he's using on his horse, Silver. Like, it was kind of a weird situation. So, do you remember back at that time, like, Obviously, Clayton Moore was was heartbroken that he wasn't playing the Lone Ranger in that movie, and he was going through a lawsuit. Were you bothered by the fact that you weren't cast as Lone Ranger in that movie? No, as a matter of fact, not at all. That doesn't even evoke that kind of a memory uh, that you speak of. Uh, No, uh, I was busy with other things at the time and happy with the way things were going. At that time, I may have been back in New York doing something on Broadway or some somewhere else in theater. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I don't recall. Uh, You know, I remember there was a good deal of publicity, I suppose, about that at the time, but I really wasn't involved in it. Didn't really have any feeling about it one way or the other. I had let that go on by since, uh, you know, it never came to. It never happened when I was, you know, in the throes of it during my time, uh, right after doing the commercial. So I just uh, moved on and to other things, and uh, I really didn't have very strong feeling about it. I, I can imagine Clayton Moore would have felt very strongly about it because that was his role, and uh, he was the first uh, important Lone Ranger, actually. So I can understand he would have been totally upset or involved in the whole process, but it didn't It didn't affect me that way. In 2013, another Lone Ranger movie was made, this time starring Army Hammer as the Lone Ranger and Johnny Depp as Tonto. Did you see that movie? And if so, what were your thoughts? Well, I hate to say it, but I, I saw a portion of it and had to turn it off. I just did I, I thought it was ludicrous for us. I, I know Johnny Depp is a hell of an actor, and he's, he's capable of so much more than that. So my, his thought process really eluded me. I don't understand what he was thinking of going, wanting to play the role and to do it in such a uh, fantastic characterization. characterization. I mean, it, it just didn't make sense to me. And I, I just think it did disservice to the, the memory, memory and the legend of the Lone Ranger. I, I really didn't care for it. So I, I didn't really uh, watch more than maybe half an hour of it. Had you played the Lone Ranger in a movie or on TV, what do you think your life would look like right now? Would it be a little bit different, drastically different, exactly the same? What do you think your life would look like had you gotten the chance to play the Lone Ranger in a movie or on TV? Yeah, no, it would have been different because of different, you know, I would have been typecast, obviously, and and as it is the case in many uh, many situations like that when people uh, get into a, a character that is that popular and that permanent, the uh, the character stays with you for years after, and so it would be difficult probably to get out of that box and go out and branch out and do the things you want to do. If you're an actor, you want to try all sorts of acting, and I I loved uh, theater work, and I love working in front of a live audience. I love doing Shakespeare, and uh, I did four musicals. I love that too. I don't know if all that would have fallen into place had I been doing uh, the Lone Ranger image all that time. So it, it does affect your life. Of course, you get, you know, there's a certain recognition, obviously, and uh, people, uh, you know, know know your name. It's a household word for those of the people for the people who really are aficionados and, and huge fans of the Lone Ranger. It's very important. But then there are others. I guess everyone in the world wasn't a Lone Ranger fan. I don't know why not, but. <laughs> They, uh, you know, they expect other things. So I was fortunate that after getting away from the laughing series, that I was able to branch out and do comedies and sitcoms like the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Dar's Day, and Don 
Don Rickles and all of those new heart. Uh, it was fun doing those characters, and I, I and on the other side of the coin, I love doing the drama too. But uh, I think it, you know, it probably would have altered my my image. I know, for example, I would suggest uh, Adam West when he did Batman. Years after he did really really didn't do very much work other than that image, and even with that, he was he was always thought of as, as Batman. You know, had a certain speech pattern which stayed with him no matter what role he did. But um, I think with a with a situation like Batman or Lone Ranger, any character like that, it becomes synonymous with the actor. So I don't know that I would have been. You know, uh, if I were able to break away from that mold and do the things I wanted to do, I would have been very happy because I would have already had the fame from doing that. But it's it's a you know double edged sword. You don't mm. know what what would happen. Um, but it would have been fun to find out and would have been interesting. There's been several actors who have played the Lone Ranger in a movie or on TV after Clayton Moore. Now John Hart played the Lone Ranger, he replaced Clayton Moore for one season, the third season, 1952 and 1953, and then in 1954, Clayton Moore took back the role and then had it for the duration of the TV series. But he does count in this story. So, John Hart, Clinton Spilsbury, Chad Michael Murray, Army Hammer, none of those guys have been accepted by the public. All of those guys have had to hear that they're not Clayton Moore and we don't want you because you're not Clayton Moore. The only guy who never has heard that and has played the Lone Ranger is you. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you were the only one accepted by the fans? All these other guys, Army Hammer was terrible, Chad Michael Murray I liked a lot, but the public doesn't like him. Quentin Spilsbury, I don't have a problem with him. I think he did a pretty good job. A lot of people don't like him because of the stuff they've heard about him and because his voice was dubbed as the Lone Ranger. A lot of people don't like that. I don't have a problem with that because I've seen enough spaghetti westerns over the course of my life. So it doesn't really bother me because basically all those movies, everyone is dubbed. Even the guys who are speaking English in those movies are dubbed. So I don't have a problem with him. And I don't really even have a problem with John Hart. Had Clayton Moore never played the Lone Ranger, I think people would have accepted John Hart as the Lone Ranger. Now, I don't think that character or that show would have lasted as long as it did and as long as it has. I don't think it it would be remembered like it was. I think it would just be remembered as a good show for that time, not a show that is still relevant to this day. I don't think John Hart as the Lone Ranger would have made that kind of impact, but I think if he, if Clayton Moore never played that role, I think that he would have been more accepted. But why do you think all those guys haven't been able to get any love, but you were the guy who got the love, and you're the guy who the people accept, and you're the guy who no one complains about? Why were you accepted as the Lone Ranger when everyone else who's not Clayton Moore isn't? Because, obviously, I would think uh, due to the response from the public, we were what they expected when they perceived the image of the Lone Ranger in Tonto. I think physically we fit the mold. I certainly had the size and the height and the carriage, I think, of the Lone Ranger. I rode the horse well. I was able to handle the gun proficiently. Uh, I knew uh, I had a good deal of knowledge about the Lone Ranger in the background. Could converse with the uh, people and the children about uh, his background. But I think by and large it was the physical appearance uh, it, uh, it just struck a chord with the, with the public, and uh, particularly when we appeared in the parades riding down Broadway or out in California and Hollywood Boulevard, wherever. I think uh, people reacted immediately, thinking that this is the Lone Ranger in Tonto. So um, that's that's my assessment. That apparently was the opinion of the people at the time, the critics and the people, the public. They all seemed to be of that opinion that. Uh, Obviously, you're proud of the work you did as the Lone Ranger, and you have great memories from that time in your life, because if you didn't have those memories, and you didn't enjoy being the Lone Ranger, you wouldn't have agreed to this interview. So, 
You obviously have good memories and you're proud of your work, but how do you view that time that you had as the Lone Ranger? Do you view it with just good memories or do you view it as a missed opportunity? Because had you continued on as the Lone Ranger, you would have either played the Lone Ranger in a movie or on TV or both. You would have either had a TV series and then made the jump to a movie like how Clayton Moore did it. We don't know. The The possibilities could have been endless had Frito-Lay continued on and continued to use you in those commercials. So how do you view your time as the Lone Ranger 40 years removed from the situation? Do you view it just with good memories or do you view it with some regrets, and also as a as a missed opportunity. How do you view your time as the Lone Ranger? Yeah, well, it was a mixed bag of all of those uh, feelings and emotions. Obviously, I would have rather had an opportunity to really do it uh, properly without, uh, you know, the extra, uh, with the situation of selling a product, which is what, in, you know, we did, in the, you know, in, in essence, that's what we were doing. And it was all fairly comical dialogue, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, but rather than, than that, I would rather have really been able to play the character and show what I thought the character should be, show a certain seriousness and strength and character, and convey a certain image to the people, and I think it would have been a, a really nice opportunity. So I, I regret that that didn't happen. I would like to have at least done one good feature um, to be able to nail that character, as mm-hmm. I think it should be... Uh, portrayed so that didn't happen so I had some regret about that but then of course I moved on with my life I had a lot of fun doing all the great sitcoms with all the beautiful ladies and then doing a theater with all the nice people I worked with so my life went on so I didn't dwell on it at all and it's only once in a while it keeps coming up because people always seem to harken back to those days when you know even though I've done so much good work and other shows and with other people that people always seem to be particularly interested in talking about the Lone Ranger and my experience with that so many years ago. So it is amazing that it is still that uh, prominent in people's minds. So I think there was a missed, opp- missed opportunity to further that image. But, uh, you know, as I said, life goes on and you, you take uh, what's dealt. So I, I don't uh, have any real regrets about it. I don't, uh, I don't really uh, dwell on it at all. It's just when the subject comes up when people ask me about it, but it's not an unhappy subject. Obviously, right now, you're thinking about that time in your life because I'm asking you about it, but in your private moments, how often do you think about your time playing the Lone Ranger? Like, if we weren't doing this interview and I didn't ask you any of these questions, would you ever think about that time you played the Lone Ranger? How often do you think about that time in your life? No, not really, not really. It's just part of my package when people look up my, uh, when they Google me or what have you, I have people everywhere, especially now in this small town, people immediately Google to see what everything you've done. And, uh, they bring it up and they want to talk about it, as I said, even regardless of all the other good work I did with a lot of wonderful people. And uh, they're interested in all of that, but for some reason it's always either the Lone Ranger or the Lassie show that people hear in the rural, uh, you know, in the South, uh, seemed to really gravitate toward that. They really loved those shows because they were good, clean family shows, and I suppose that, uh, that prominence in their minds. But uh, I don't, you know, think about it other than when, it's, uh, when the question is prompted and people ask me about it, well, I just um, go on with my life and, you know, people want to talk about various things and other shows or movies and what have you, that's fine. Uh, but it's not something I dwell on at all. It was just part of the past, and it was a you know an interesting time. I'm glad I did it, but uh, just went on with my life from there, and that's that's what I have to do. What's your favorite memory from playing the Lone Ranger? Just the reaction, the, the really heartfelt reaction from the people, from the public, from the audience. I enjoyed the uh, playing the role. I enjoyed the image. I enjoyed my concept of what the Lone Ranger should be. Uh, being accepted as as graciously as it was, people were really wonderful about it and uh, looked at me as though they really believed that I was a Lone Ranger when I was in costume and were talking to them. So that was all very gratifying, and I think that's the best part of that I can think of. It was just the reaction from the public and the children. 
Jack, before I let you go, the fans want to hear from you. The Lone Ranger fans want to hear from someone who's played the character. It's not every day we get to hear from someone who's played the Lone Ranger. So do you have a message for the fans? Well, I just want to thank them for being such steadfast fans, for being so loyal, and the complimentary throughout the years, uh, whenever the subject uh, arises, they, uh, they always seem more excited about talking about the fact that I did the Lone Ranger more than any other of the really good roles that I've played with so many wonderful people. So I think the reaction, as I said, and the camaraderie that I've had with all of the public is a good memory for me, and it's, it goes on today. I constantly am running into people that want to talk to me about the Lone Ranger and how I felt about it and my experiences with it. And, uh, it was a good, wholesome image. I enjoyed very much doing it, and uh, I think the greatest, most gratifying part about the whole thing was my connection with the people, with the fans, the people who loved that that image and the fact that they accepted me and, and Nick as Tonto, I think that uh, that's the most gratifying part. So I want to thank everyone for still caring about it, caring about carrying on with the Lone Ranger image. I, I think it's a, a good image, particularly in this day and time. I think we need more good, clean-cut images like that. Jack, we want to thank you for playing this part and doing such a wonderful job Thank you for your contributions to the character, and also thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate uh, your words, and uh, it was a good interview, and I enjoyed talking to you, and it evokes some nice memories from the past. I'm uh, I'm happy we uh, 